Talmor, Sheshin Mugachi. Talmor is my home. My family have worked the land for generations. My gran says the island does not belong to us, but we belong to the island. And we must be ready for a great evil is coming. And death follows with it. Listen and subscribe to the latest season of Undertow, The Harrowing, a story glass production presented by Realm, available wherever you get your podcasts. Contained herein are the heresies of Radolf Buntwein, erstwhile monk turned traveling medical investigator. Join me as I study the secrets of the divine plagues and uncover the blasphemous truth that ours is not a loving God and we are not its favored children. The Heresies of Radolf Buntwein, wherever podcasts are available. and welcome back to another episode of Thanks for Coming In. I'm your host, Jillian Clare. Today on the show, we're going to do something fun. We're going to go back and re-listen to some of my favorite audition stories that we've heard on the show. I think what I'm going to do is uh, choose them randomly because there's so many good ones. So many good ones. I invite you to go back and listen to it all because there's, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, But, you know, it's kind of fun to hear these back to back to truly get that perspective of, yeah, we have all been there as actors. If you're an actor listening to this, it's nice to to hear that people from all sorts of points in their career have the same struggles. And if you're somebody who is uh, listening because they like pop culture, well, this is a great thing for you, too. It's a good little trivia time. So let's have some trivia time. And... Without further ado, enjoy. Okay, so our first story comes from Fear Street actress Julia Raywald. Here it is. Oh, probably. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. (laughs) I like didn't think about this beforehand, and then, but then, and as soon as you said that, I was like, oh, this is this is an easy story. Like the (laughs) easy, like worst audition I've had ever was like a callback, actually, which I don't know how I even got a callback for it. But in college, like my first audition after I met my first agent was like for Hamilton. Oh my gosh. And it was for um, Eliza and and the youngest sister. Peggy. Peggy. Yes, yes, yes. And I like grew up doing musical theater. And I guess I, I would say like I have a good, like I can sing. Mm -hmm. But I haven't, I hadn't sung actively since like freshman year of college. I took one musical theater class. So like I I had not sung in years. And then this callback was like, it was the, um, it was like all like, (laughs) all the high note riffs, all the like (laughs) very vocally demanding songs for these characters. And I had three songs that I had to do. And I think me and the casting director both knew like halfway through the first song (laughs) that it just wasn't (laughs) going to happen. We both knew. We both knew what was going on. I was like, I can't hit half of these notes. But I sadly had to make him sit through the next two songs. And I was was like, like, can we just, we can just stop now. But I just was like, let's just do it. And then, um... I was like, thank you so much for letting me sing really badly in front of you for the past 10 minutes. (laughs) I'll see myself out now. So now that we've heard an audition story about auditioning for Hamilton, let's shift and go to Hamilton actor Warren Egypt Franklin. I think okay, (laughs) this one is bad, but then it's it ends with a happy ending. So I was in final callbacks in New York for uh uh what was it oh the lion king for simba um oh wow for the tour so i I went in for the team and uh simba sings a song called endless night 
And I don't know how the top, top note is. It's like, um, I, know that I, I forget how the song goes. But I know once I got to the top note, I cracked, y'all. And I cracked really badly. And I've never cracked an audition before. And if I have, it wasn't like on a money note. Like this was like on the money note, in front of casting, in front of the team. And I left out feeling so defeated. I felt so defeated. And I walked out with my head down. Uh, I felt so bad. And and like you saw the team behind the table when I hit the note kind of go like, ooh. And I was like, oh, my God. I I shouldn't have looked at that. Like it was truly embarrassing. So I get on the train. I'm like, well. I'm about to go get some ice cream because I, I, I celebrate my defeats with ice cream and I celebrate my losses with ice cream as well. <laughs> uh, I mean, my, my wins, if I win something and I feel good, ice cream. If I do something bad, ice cream as well. But yeah, so I, I was going to the ice cream place, which was kind of by Wall Street. So I was underground. So I couldn't mm-hmm. get any calls from my agents um, because I was underground. And then I saw my agent's number pop in my phone and I was like, damn, he's calling me to tell me like, just how bad it was like I got a call from my agent after the audition like this is terrible I didn't really want to answer the phone and so I want to say I did it and he sent me a text or a voicemail or something was like call me back as soon as you get this and I was like damn like I'll never be in Lion King so I answered the phone and then that's actually when he told me that Hamilton he was like I was like oh did, did Lion King tell you how bad the callback was he was like Lion King he was like, who cares about Lion King? I'm not calling about Lion King. I'm calling to tell you that actually you got your call back for Hamilton and they want to see you on Monday. And I was like, fuck yeah. So like, wow. it just never, it, it, it was pretty bad. It, it, it ended kind of happy, you know? It was, and I tell people, was for you, it was for you. As great as I think I could have been for Simba for that, that wasn't that wasn't my project. That wasn't for me at right. that time, you know? And, and whoever that brother is who stepped into that role, that was him, that was his time. Um, his his project, and I'm I'm super happy for whoever that that person is. A, a win for another black man is a win for me, but um, that just wasn't my project. And I tell people all the time, "What's for you is what's for you." Ain't that the truth? What is for you is for you. Um, it's a difficult concept to remember in this industry, but one that definitely helps you get through. So now let's move on to a little story from 1883 actor Eric Nelson. Oh my gosh. I feel like <laughs> all my auditions are terrible stories. <laughs> like, something's always going wrong. Or I mean, it's just, I don't like auditions. Um, Who there's does? so much harder. I know. And there's so much harder now. I mean, the self-taping thing is fun and easy because you can like take all the time you need in the world. But yeah, I do but... miss that, like that interaction. Well, with the, the interaction and the redirection and the things that you, that happen in the room that can only happen in the room. Right, right, right. I I miss it so much, but uh, let me think. Um, (laughs) Oh, jeez, there's been... So I went through this period of time where I was like, all right, I really need to go in there completely the character, look, everything, like fully committed. If it says this guy's got... Uh, I don't know, a mustache. I If I can't grow one, I was going to go in there with like a fake mustache <laughs> on, like the cheesiest, worst thing. And one time I'm auditioning for a movie to play uh, Terry Melcher, or I think that was his last name, who he was um, during the, the Charlie Manson stuff. He was the record producer mm. that was, uh, you know, Charlie was wanting to work with him and he had this long blonde hair like I have and kind of have similar looks, but he had these like crazy sideburns oh, no. that went all the way down. I was like, there's no way I can grow those. I went to a wig shop. No, you did not. Yes, I did. And I was like, I'm going to put these sideburns and I'm going to look so much like him and give a, a great performance. They're, they're just going to give me the, the contract right then in there. I walk in the room. It takes the casting three seconds to be like, what's on your face? <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? I'm like playing it off. You know, I was like, what do you mean? Is it, can you take off the sideburns? Like they were, I guess they were that fake. And now they look back like they were horrible. Uh, She's like, that's, that was, and like was laughing at me. Like you're doing. And I, I, I was dead. I was dead serious. I thought it was the best idea in the world. And like big, like they're taking up most of my face. Yeah. <laughs> and, and 
three seconds she just starts laughing and like didn't take me seriously from that point on and not a word i said of my audition went through her head she was like this kid's a joke like why like you know is this is this a clown costume oh no it's how i felt she interpreted what i was doing um and yeah so she made me take them off and then of course like the sticky glue shits on my face <laughs> and it's like clumpy and like looking where I'm like, this is the worst possible thing that could have happened. And I went in there thinking it was the smartest thing. And from that moment on, I was like, all right, nope, no. nope. We're going to let the work do the talking yep. and uh, that'll be that. <laughs> oh my God. Moral of the story, kids, don't wear your sideburns into an audition. And for that matter, uh, let's get real here for a second. If you're an actor and you're auditioning and you're auditioning for, let's say, a cop, don't walk in in a uniform. Just don't do it. They know what a uniform looks like. They want to see you. Anywho, let's move on. Now let's hear a story from Diary of a Future President actor Charlie Bushnell. This one time I got this audition um, for uh, this movie, uh, Spin. It's a Disney movie. It like just came out, and uh, my friend Avantika, who who was in season one of Diary, she uh, she's actually the main character in the movie. Mm. Um, but uh, but in the like in the notes in the audition, they said, um, "Please like like come in prepared with a with a British accent." And I was oh, like, dear. "Oh!" And I only had like a few days to like get this get this ready, so. Um, so I, you know, I, I kind of just watched some, uh, some like British shows and like, <laughs> and I, I have, I have a couple friends with British accents. And so I talked to them a lot. Um, and, uh, I thought I was prepared and I, I was feeling good about it. Yeah. Uh, and I went into the audition and, uh, you know, I, I did a great job if, if the character was Australian, um, no. <laughs> cause it definitely came out Australian uh, in the audition. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Like I thought, I, I thought I had it down, but then I, I don't know. I guess I was nervous. Um, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> All right. To round this episode up, we're not going to do a whole lot because, um, there's just too many good ones to choose from. And honestly, it's like overwhelming to choose which ones I want to reshare, but to round this episode out, we're going to we're going to share the story from Gina Naomi Baez, who honestly had one of the funniest, like, oh my God, what did I just do moments in an audition that I think I've ever heard. It, it's just truly brilliant. Um, so here it is. Okay. So when I first got out of college, I went in for like, di- oh, I'm not um, well, it's bleep. <laughs> Yeah, I went in for this production, <laughs> um, and actually, it was on a cruise ship. Which now I'm like, oh my god, I will never work on a cruise ship because I then went. I never was on a cruise ship ever, and like I went on a cruise and I was so sick for a while. So I was like, oh, I could never live on this. Like no. this would not work for me. I'd be so sick. So anyway, but long story short, the audition room was very small. And I had to do this scene where I was like a brat, like a bratty kid. And I don't know like what possessed me to do this, but the, (laughs) the guy was just sitting there and he had his coffee, his Dunkin' Donuts coffee. I remember this vividly. And I was, I was doing the scene. And for some reason I like slammed the table because it was like such a small room. And I slammed (laughs) the table, like being a brat. I was like, no. And like, (laughs) And then the coffee, no, (laughs) the coffee just like, I don't even know how this happened. I guess I slapped the table really hard because I was giving 150% as I told you. Of course, of course. (laughs) The coffee just kind of went flying like up (laughs) in the air and went all over him. And he was so pissed. Like, oh my God. And I just stopped and I was like, I'm so sorry. I don't know why I just slept the table. I was possessed. I don't know what came over me. I'm so sorry. And I just kept saying sorry. And he was like, it's fine. And like, but I could just see like the anger like behind his eyes. Like, It's that it's fine where it, where it really means if you say one more word to me, I will kill you. 
Yeah, it was it was so bad and it was like terrible. Like, and I remember I walked out, I left and I was just like I just started crying. Like oh, I, was, no. I was just like I felt so stupid and I was just so embarrassed and I did not get a call back. <laughs> okay. Thanks for tuning in for this fun little uh, rewind episode um, that we've put together over here. Um, If you're not subscribed to the show, what the heck are you doing? Hit that subscribe button. Leave us some love, some stars, some reviews. It helps a lot. I know every podcaster says it because it's true. It's very true. Um, And tune in next week for a brand new episode. And as always, thanks for coming in. Hi, I'm Alexis Ohanian. You may know me as one of the co-founders of Reddit, but more recently, a large part of my identity is being a father to my two wonderful daughters. In my podcast, Business Dad, I'm hoping to open up the conversation about balancing careers and family. The one thing I constantly hear successful people say, without fail, is that they wish they'd spent more time with their kids. That's time no one can get back. So I decided to create Business Dad, to engage in the conversation about how we're spending our time now, providing a forum for successful dads to share their joys and challenges of being a working parent. You'll get to hear from a wide range of business dads, from Rain Wilson and Guy Raz to Todd Carmichael and Shane Battier. And while this podcast will talk about business and will definitely be featuring dads, I think everyone can learn something from these incredible conversations as we unpack the expectations we all have about careers, relationships, and ourselves. Business Dad is available now, so be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.